Welcome, welcome once again to 720 and 720. This is John Schulman, and uh, we are actually up early. I'm not sure if we're on Central Time or Eastern Time, but we <laughs> we are up early to meet and to visit with Mike Cleansing. Hey, Mike, is that how you say your last name? That is exactly how you say it. You got it right. Just like it looks, although it's been butchered many times. So I'll answer to just about anything. But cleansing is correct. I, I've answered to a lot of things myself in my career, uh, but but not Shulman being one of them. <laughs> uh, Mike is the founder and executive director of Head Start Basketball. He's an Ohio guy. He played at Kent State. Thank God he wasn't. I don't think you were on the team that whipped us at Chattanooga. Were you? I was not. I was not on that team. So Did, I'm a little bit. I was a little bit before. Uh, I was a little bit before that time. Did you play with I'm Antonio old. Gates? Antonio Gates is about that team that went to the final, uh, the final eight in the NCAA tournament from Kent was ten years after me. So that was 2002, and I was finished in '92. So I'm old. You are old. Were, were you, could you play? I could play. I could play. I still, I still tell, I tell people all the time. I still own two school records at Kent State. So one of the records I still have is nine threes in a game. Okay. That hasn't been broken yet. So I could shoot it a little bit. And then the other record I have is probably the more interesting one. I have the single game steals record, which is eight. Now I want you to keep in mind that I probably have, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I probably have 30 steals in my entire career <laughs> and I got eight of them in one game. And so I still remember after that game, the beat reporter who covered the team for the Cleveland Plain dealer at the time came up to me after the game and we were just talking. He said, how did you get, eight steals in a game and I still remember the quote because it then went in the newspaper and got into the article and I said I don't know I said they just kept passing me the ball so <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there was no my my, uh, my ability to steal the ball and my quickness were, were not my fortes but in that particular game for whatever reason um, I just kept getting the ball passed to me so that's why I, so those are the two records that I still have so I could play back in the day I, I'm going to tell you this nine threes in a game in what nine I mean 91 92 what year was it that was my junior year that I did that, so that would so have been 90, 91? 90, 90, 91. Yes, that was against Air Force. To make nine threes in a game in 1991 uh, was special because yeah. I, I was coaching back then, and um, that's how old I am. I was coaching back then, and not many people were sitting there jacking up uh, three after three. It's not like today's game. Tell us about tell us about making nine three nine threes in a game back in ninety one uh, is probably like making thirteen fourteen now. Yeah, I mean there just wasn't the volume of shooting at that point. I mean I don't think anybody really had come around on the idea of how valuable the three is. The way analytics has led everybody to believe that it's so important today. And so if I had played in that era of you know now, I think that I would have shot way more than what I did back in the time that I played. And because it just, again, it just wasn't emphasized. Not that, you know, I was being dissuaded from shooting them, but I certainly wasn't being encouraged in the same way that, you know, a player who could shoot the ball like I could, you know, would be today if you were playing in the game. You remember like me, I remember an NBA game back in the day and somebody would make a three and it'd be like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was I like can't believe he just shot. I just can't believe he just shot that. He just shot a three. It, that was it, crazy. And there was only so many guys that even, you know, would attempt them. I know I, I forget the exact number, but, you know, somewhere I remember reading like Larry Bird one year led the league in threes made, and it was like 86. Like he made 86 threes. I mean, James Harden gets 86 threes in 10 games. At, uh, 10. Probably <laughs> try five. And, and no one says, no, I mean, it's just a game. I, I, you know, will they move the line back? I would not move the line back. I mean, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure that I'm a fan of the volume of threes that are being shot today. Like the one thing that bothers me again, this is the old guy get off my lawn type, you know, take here. But the one thing I don't like is on a fast break where it's a two on one, or it's a three on one and guys are just flaring out to the three point line to shoot. To me, it still makes more sense to get a dunk or a layup. So that's the one part of it that I don't like, but otherwise I think it has spaced the floor. I think it has made, the game it's opened it up a little bit and again i think from a fan standpoint and from a player standpoint people like offense and so i think from that you know perspective that the game is probably better in that way and yet at the same time i think that there's there's something inherently strange about the fact that you know for so long when you're a kid you're taught to try to get the best shot possible that you can as close to the basket as possible and then as you get to the higher levels of the game that 
changes and you're no longer trying to get a shot in the paint. You're now trying to get a shot from outside the three point line. But I, I think if you move it back, I don't know. I, I, then it becomes a novelty again. And I'm not sure that that's the direction that we want to go with basketball. I, I think college basketball is close to moving theirs back. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I, I could see the college game going, going to the NBA line. I, I'm not sense? sure they're going NBA. I think they'll maybe go FIBA first. Okay, uh, but but I think they're I think they're really close to fooling around with that line. I think they're really close to um, widening the lane. Um, I think the line will go back before the lane gets widened. Uh, but you widen the lane, that takes away, you know, once again, it takes away a little bit more inside basketball, right? Uh, and pushes everything out, which I'm not a huge fan because I was old fashioned and. You know, I, I I wasn't old fashioned when I was an assistant, and then when I became a head coach, I said, "Let's throw that ball inside. Let's, let's go try get, to get some good shots." Right? Yeah, let's go get fouled. I don't really care. <laughs> assistant, hey, Jacker up there as That's a head right. coach. I was going, Let, "Let's go get fouled. Let's play a little bit safer." My name's on the on the big door, and my contract's on the line. Hey, listen, t- <laughs> all right, tell us about tell us a bit because I got good question for you. All right, because we're really going to help some people today, and I, I want to know more about some areas that you're an expert in tell us about head start basketball real quick all right so head start basketball is a company that i started actually my uh was i guess it was my second year out of college and i kind of had an idea of wanting to run some basketball camps and those i that idea came from actually a relationship i had with a guy named scott roth who scott grew up in a city uh close to me and he played a couple of years in the NBA, uh, went to the University of Wisconsin and played there. And then he bounced around Europe and bounced around the NBA, played a couple of years, actually played with the Jazz for one season. And while he played with the Jazz, he lived in Carl Malone's house with with Carl Malone. So and he became good friends with Don Nelson. And right now he's coaching the Iowa Wolves G League team. Okay. But long story short, Scott had run a camp in my hometown at the high school and he probably had I don't know, 75 or 80 kids at this camp one summer while I was in college. And at that point, Scott had been out of school uh, for a while and he was, he was playing, I think in Europe at that time. And so he wasn't, it wasn't like Scott was a household name. And yet, you know, I looked at him like, wow, he's got 75 or 80 kids here at this camp. You know, when I get done with school, my name, at least in my hometown is still going to be one that's pretty recognized. Maybe I should start a camp. So my original idea was to run like a neighborhood camp, each one of the elementary schools in my hometown of Strongsville. So there was, I believe, seven schools at the time. And so I ran seven different sessions of camp at each one of the elementary schools. And that lasted for a year because I was working seven weeks. Yeah. And I ended up consolidating the camp down to, uh, down to four sessions and did that at the high school and then the junior high, split between those two. And so – as I got started, the idea and what I did with the camps just sort of evolved over time. And I wanted it to be a teaching camp. I wanted it to be a camp that kids would have fun at. And I wanted it to be a camp where after the kid got done, they wanted to play more basketball. And that's continued to sort of be my philosophy, especially when it comes to youth basketball is the three goals I tell parents when I give my speech, either at the beginning of camp or at the end of camp or with anything that we're doing. I always say, one, I want to make sure your kid has fun. Two, I want to make sure they learn something about the game of basketball. And then three, I want to make sure that when they're done, that they get an opportunity to want to come back and do something else, whether that's with me or whether that's just them wanting to go up and shoot in the driveway or drill the ball in the basement, whatever. Those are the three main goals that I have. And those have continued to kind of be the pillars of what I've done with Head Start Basketball in terms of the camp. So for a long time, I was coaching in high school. I was an assistant varsity coach for 13 years, the exact same staff under the head, same head coach. Uh, it was just a great experience, and I was happy with my camp in the summertime. It was a great summer job as a teacher. Uh, I eventually added a week of camp out by where I teach, and so for a long time I had those five sessions of camp. And then I would say probably it was around 2000, maybe 2009, I stopped coaching, and at that point I started to try to expand my business and do a little bit more, so we got into some of the individual training and skill development stuff. And then I started adding weeks of camp. So this summer, uh, I'll be up to, I believe I'm going to have 11 different sessions of camp in eight different locations around the Cleveland area. And so this will be the first year that we've really expanded where we're going to run a camp or two where I will not be the main director. So I've had to 
had to hire somebody to be able to do that and sort of be the me of that camp. And it's been a big step for me to let go of what I want to do. But really my goal is to be able to grow and I can't do that physically by being everywhere. Yep. And I want to be able to impact more kids. And to me, that's really what it's all about is to be able to know that what I'm doing is having a positive influence on the kids who are coming to my camp. And so if I can expand and grow and touch more kids, I think in the long run, that's really what I'm all about. Well, I, I want to go. I, here's where I want to do. I want to go back to fun. <laughs> um, okay. Le- learn something about the game and and making the kids want to come back. Okay. And and so th- those three things I think are phenomenal. And and I, I want your help. And we're going to use this podcast to help hopefully parents today and and maybe some some players. Um, but you tell me uh, in this day and age of of everybody's got a trainer and we send our kids and, and I've sent my kids to different trainers cause I didn't really want to train them individually. What does, uh, tell me I've got an eight year old child that loves basketball. What should I do with him? I'm a parent. What should I do with him? He loves the game. Um, we live in an area that, you know, the Y, the Y league is, is done now. It's before AAU, Tell me what I want from a trainer. Tell me what I should be focused on. Uh, I've got an eight-year-old kid. So I think the number one thing for me, and this is something that I try to talk to parents about all the time, is whatever it is that you're doing, you want to make sure that it's child-driven and not parent-driven. So too often I see parents who sign their kids up or push their kids to go with a trainer or play in a league or you know go and play on two different AAU teams And I often look at those situations and I just don't think that the vast majority of kids want that much basketball, or you could take it to another sport, whether that's they're doing it with soccer or they're doing it with hockey or whatever. I I just don't think that there's that many kids that want to be doing that that much. So I think that's the first thing that any parent should look at is, is what I'm doing driven by my own needs or by the needs of my child. All right. And let's, I'm sitting here going, Oh my God! Uh, uh, why, why is my son playing forty-eight thousand baseball games in the summer? Is it because of me right. or my kid? Right. Uh, I, I think that's a great point because I mean I see and you see. I mean I went to a high school game the other day that I saw a dad coaching his kid, but the dad wasn't on the bench. He was on the other side of the court in the stands, and I'm sitting there going, "Gracious day, we have lost our minds." On what's yeah, going we see, on. I it, see that. <laughs> I see that all the time as far as people coaching in the stands. And that's one of the things that, you know, I've, I've tried to do a really good job with my kids in all of my sports. Uh, you know, obviously when I'm coaching them, if I'm actually coaching their team, then I'm their coach and I'm coaching them. And if I'm a parent sitting in the stands, then I'm a parent sitting in the stands and I just sit there and I still have people, my son's in seventh grade. So this was the first year that he played on his school team. And so, I obviously didn't coach that school team, so I was just a parent sitting in the stands. And I remember the first game, I had a couple of parents come up to me, and I sat through the first half and you know didn't say anything, and they're kind of cheering and saying things and you know just making comments. And I just sat there silently the whole first half. And I remember a couple of dads that you know I know fairly well saying to me, "Hey, you know how how can you just sit there like don't you want to like you know don't you want to say anything?" Don't you? And I'm like, "Look, I go, he's not listening to me anyway." And Whatever I'm going to yell, he's not going to take it to heart. He doesn't take it to heart a lot of times when I'm coaching him on the sideline, on the sidelines. Let alone, you know, trying to hear me from the stands. So there's there's just so much there's so much scientific backing out there behind the fact that kids aren't processing what you're saying from the stands anyway. And then the things that you're saying oftentimes are a direct contradiction to what the coach is telling your kid. And so now, if I'm a kid and my dad's in the stands telling me one thing and my coach is on the sideline telling me something else. Now I'm conflicted and I don't know what to do. And that can't add to the kid's performance. There's just no possible way that it makes the kid perform better. And again, let's face it. What are most parents yelling from the stands, John? What's the most Shoot common it. Thing? Shoot right, it. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's just a situation where, you know, you're not benefiting your kid because obviously the coach doesn't want your kid to shoot the ball every single time he gets it. Unless, you know, for some reason your kid is Steph Curry. Then I guess if you're Dell, yeah, then maybe you can yell, shoot it. But otherwise, 
for the vast majority of parents, I don't think that's, I don't think that's what they want to be doing. I, I, I think one of our jobs, I, the, the intelligent basketball people and me and you, because of the Eastern central time thing, we are so <laughs> intelligent. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, I do the same thing. So I go watch my kid play and, and I keep my mouth shut and I clap and, and I encourage and I don't yell and scream because I don't want other people don't need to be yelling and scream. I, I, my best buddy, he was, I, I, you know, we started talking about it and he was like, you know, my, my son's got to follow his shot. I was like, listen, man, don't, don't ever say that again. That ended like in 1978. Follow your shot, Tommy. Right. All right. Yeah, don't, don't, don't hold your foul. Don't hold your follow through. Chuck that just, ball up there and start running after. Just him. follow your shot. And and my best buddy's going to listen to this and he's going to say, "I'm not going to use his name, Clint, at all." All right. <laughs> uh, but but what you what you just encourage because uh, you know and, and I tell this story. My my brother got into a situation with my father. And my father wasn't a basketball guy. And and my father uh, didn't go to a game, and my brother played pretty good, but he didn't shoot. He didn't shoot in the game. And my father said, "How'd you play?" He said, "Well, I I, uh, I played pretty good. How many points you score?" Uh, well, Dad, I didn't score. He was like, "How many shots did you take?" He said, "I didn't shoot." And he said, "Well, you'll shoot at least four times next game. I'm coming to the game, or I'm not going to come to the game anymore." And I used to tell our parents, uh, Dylan, <laughs> when I was coaching. You know, what, what's my brother supposed to do? He's supposed to shoot and please his dad? Or is he supposed to not shoot and please his coach? And, and you're putting a kid in a really bad spot. And I asked the parents, what do you think my brother did? And some of them said, please the dad. Some of them said, please the coach. And I said, no, he, he quit because he got, <laughs> he got put in such a bad spot, he couldn't win. Yeah, and, and that's exactly. what we do to our kids because when, I, when I'm coaching – if if a kid is shooting a ball when he's supposed to pass it and he's listening to his parents, his parents have just absolutely royally screwed him. And, and that's what happens. And, um, and that it's goes back to parent driven or child driven. The, the kid just wants to have fun. We, yep. we, as parents, we, we can screw up there. I don't think we mean to, <laughs> I don't think that's our purpose. Uh, but I think we do a lot of screwing up things. Yeah, I think there's a lot of pressure, uh, peer pressure from other parents, and where parents look around and they see that this kid over here is playing on this team or going to this trainer or doing playing this much, and all of a sudden I look around and I'm like, well, I'm not doing that. So, boy, that person must know better than me, and they must know what they're doing. And so then I feel the pressure to go and do those same things. And I think that's where the danger comes in. One of the the things that I always think about is, you know, a lot of times it's just difficult for parents, especially parents who haven't gone through the system either themselves as a player or they haven't had a child who's gone through it before. You just don't know what the landscape looks like and what decisions you should or shouldn't be making. And so therefore you're able to be influenced by a lot of people who oftentimes have Maybe not your kid's best interest at heart, but they see you as a blank check that they can bring in the door and then start working with and start getting you involved in things. And it's again, it's just not best for your kid. I'm a big believer in it's got to be it's got to be kid driven. And I'm a big believer that there are multiple pathways for a kid to become a high school player or become a college player. You don't have to do it the way everybody else does it. And one of the things that, you know, you asked about what are some things that, that I'd recommend. And I think the, one of the biggest keys is the type of coach that you have. If you're talking about an AAU program and you're talking about being involved on a team, to me, the coach is the most important element of that. And if the coach is teaching the game, if the coach is making the game fun, if the coach is making about more than wins and losses, then that's the kind of thing that you want to look for both in the coach and, and in the program, the league, the trainer, whatever it is that, you know, whatever program you're looking to get involved with, I think those are questions that you want to ask. I mean, anybody can toss out their their one loss record, their number of AAU national championships and this and that. But for the average kid, that stuff doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is, are they being taught during practice? Are they? Is it about more than just... I want to win games. Is it about teaching them a little bit and using basketball as a vehicle to, to teach about life and build character? And those are things that I think parents sometimes lose sight of 
when they're just chasing getting their kid on the best team because it's a parent ego thing as opposed to uh, an actual child development thing. Did did you say sometimes parents? Lo- I mean, sometimes, okay, some uh, okay, most 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 no, times. No, it, it's it's a, it's and we're not picking on parents because I, I am one and you are one. Um, yep. and so what, but what happens is you, you feel like you're getting behind and, and if, and if your, your son or daughter is not working out with that guy and, and playing on that team, you feel like you're screwing your child That's and, absolutely. And, and you get behind and you're behind eight ball and my son's not, oh my gosh. I mean, he's not on that eight year old AAU team and, and what should I be doing with my eight year old? You know, I've got all these people that ask me, it was like, what, what should I be doing? I said, you should be having fun. He's eight years old. You know, let's kill him right now. Let's go kill him and let's do two a day training. And let's by age 14, he's never wanting to play basketball again. That's not the point. The point is like what you're saying, your last thing, do, do, do the kids want to come back? <laughs> do the kids yep. want to go out and shoot? You know, make it kid driven and not parent driven. And and I know that's very difficult for parents to do is to take a step back because I you know, it's not as difficult, you know, your your first one, I mean, you we all screw up our first child. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> and so our third right now, we've got three boys. Our third is is the most easygoing kid because we haven't had enough energy to screw him up. Um, the first we we had him playing game after game. Our third is going to be the best one of them all if he gets his head out of his tail uh, <laughs> um, to to go to go play the game the right way uh, because we we haven't been it hasn't been as parent driven on him it's been more kid driven um, yeah all right all right focusing all right so so. In this day and age of training, I've got an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old. What should a training session look like? What should we be working on? What should I look for in a in a trainer? Um, how much should it be so I don't get in a mess here if I'm a parent? So, so I think to me, one of the things that I always try to make sure that when I'm building into a training session, whether it's myself or one of the coaches that works for me. I think there are a couple things that you want to make sure that is happening. One, you have to make sure that the trainer is somebody who fits the, the, the style and the age of your kid. Like there's some people who are great trainers for a high school varsity player, but if you have an eight year old, that person may not be the right person for your kid. So I think that's the, that's the number one thing. If you match up the strength of the trainer and sort of where their sweet spot is with the age of the kid. And then when I'm building a training session, what I would look for, especially in a youth basketball trainer is I would look for somebody who focuses in on one footwork. So whether that's pivoting, whether that's footwork on the shot, whether that's defensive footwork, uh, to me, footwork is so very important and too often it gets overlooked and we want to focus on all these glamor skills and going between our legs and shooting step backs and doing all these different things. And really what kids just need to be able to do is front pivot, reverse pivot on balance, be able to stop, you know, going from full speed and being able to stop, whether that's with the dribble, whether that's off the shot, whatever it might be. So I think footwork is, is key. There, there needs to be footwork involved in any training session that you get involved with. That's number one. And then I think the second piece of it that goes along with that is you want to make sure that, the drills that the trainer is doing are going to match up with the child's skill level. Cause very often, you know, I'll see where a trainer might be working with a kid and it's kind of a cookie cutter approach and everybody's doing the same thing and it may not match up with, you know, your eight year old may not shouldn't be doing the same drills as a 13 year old. So you want to make sure that that person has planned and gone in and, and done their homework to understand what the kids should be doing. And I think if you do those two things, then the last piece of it is you want to make sure that not only are the kid, is the kid working hard, but that they're also having fun. Cause it goes back to my philosophy of you want to have fun. You want to learn something and you want to make the kid come back. And you know, I've seen where parents sometimes will take their kids to somebody who's yelling at the kid and doing that kind of stuff. And to me, ultimately in the long run, that goes to what you talked about a minute ago, where it drives kids out of the game. And so, yeah, maybe I'm a little better when I'm nine, but by the time I'm 13, 
I'm tired of people yelling at me and I really don't like basketball anymore. So I'm not going to play in high school because I just don't like the game. And that's the danger uh, is when you push a kid too hard, too fast um, when they're young, that, that they're going to drop out. So I think if you look for a trainer that puts a focus on fundamentals and footwork, I think if you look at somebody that matches up with the age of your child, and then I think if you look at the fact that you're going to have somebody who does something that makes it fun so that your kid's going to want to come back and do more. And again, hopefully the trainer's going to inspire the kid not only to work when they're with the trainer, but also to go down their basement and dribble or go out on the driveway and shoot and, you know, do something else um, with the game as opposed to just being driven out by somebody who's a negative influence. Yeah, but see, it's, uh, having fun with the game, I mean, that's what we all did when we were young. I mean, we, we'd go out in the backyard and have fun playing a game. We'd play one-on-one or two-on-two, three-on-three, and we'd have a good time, and we'd have yep. fun. I mean, th- it was like we rarely ever played a game, like a real true game, because there weren't a whole lot of games to be played. That's why they were so important. We, we have, we have we, we play too many games now. I mean, there's AAU games and then going to the fall league rec games and then your regular season and then the spring. Uh, it's, it's you know, like we said one other time <laughs> when I did a podcast with you, you know, after the big game and you get beat at the buzzer, the first question is, uh, are we going to Subway or Firehouse? Right, exactly. Uh, and, yep. and what are we going to eat between the next game? Because we got to go to the next game. If I ever lost a game at the buzzer when I was young, I mean, you, you may not play another game forever. I mean, it hurt. Yeah, I would be cru- I would have been crushed. I would have been crushed. I agree. And kids today don't, it doesn't, losing doesn't take on the same meaning. Even if you take it away from, you know, obviously when you and I played, we played less games. So each game was more meaningful, whether that's, you know, our school season or, you know, off season, whatever. You just didn't get as many opportunities to play as kids do today. And at the same time, I think that one of the things that's made kids, that has made losing hurt less and has made them less competitive is the fact that, you know, when I was playing and I was 14, 15, 16, or I was in college and playing, I'd be out on the playgrounds playing pickup games and you play pickup games at the places where I played, at least you'd sit for, you know, an hour after you lost. And so you were going to do everything that you could to avoid losing because you knew that you weren't going to get to play again. And why did you want to play? You wanted to play because it was fun. And so that made you more competitive. And nowadays, Again, kids don't play pickup games in that same way. Even if they do play pickup games, it's almost never in a situation where there's people waiting to take them out of the game. Like they might get together with their friends occasionally and play three on three or four on four or whatever, but there's no team waiting to make them sit after the fact. I mean, those places, at least around here where I am, those places just don't exist anymore. And I think that takes away from the competitiveness. And again, I, you know, we're all biased towards the system that we grew up in. So I still think that the system that I grew up in where I was playing with older people all the time, I was 14 playing with high school kids and college kids and adults. And I think that made me better. So I'm a proponent of that system, but you know, it's never coming back. So I think we have to figure out how do we make the best of the situation that we have. And I think the way you do that is by making sure that the kids not playing on multiple AAU teams, that you give them a break at some point during the year. I read somewhere where somebody had a quote basically saying that, you know, professional athletes take time off, you know, and yet we expect our eight year old kid to play, you know, during, they play in a winter league with their community. Then they play AAU basketball in the spring. Then they're in a summer league. Then they play in a fall league. And then they're right back into their travel community season. And they never, ever take any time off. And I just don't believe John that, that there's that many, let's say seven to 12 year old kids that love basketball that much that they need to be playing that much time. And we forget sometimes that they're kids and that they need time to, you know, to just play and just not just play basketball, but just run around and play and do other things. (laughs) And, And so I think that's one of the things that we as parents sometimes lose sight of in the rat race of trying to make sure that we're not missing out on what everybody else is doing. And it's hard. I mean, I know it's hard. I'm, I'm a parent myself. And there's times where even with everything that I know that I'll look at my situation with my kids and be like, Oh, I should push them a little bit more. I'm, am I, am I, am I being hard? Am I being hard enough on them? And, and I always come back to, you know what, if I have to push them and I have to drive them to do these things, then it's not really what they want. And so I've just really taken a, 
not completely hands-off approach approach because I still provide my kids with opportunities and I'll still ask, but if they say no, um, you know, I just back off. And my hope is, is that in the long run that it's going to pay off in two ways. One, that maybe that spark will come on for them at some point and it will become more child driven. And two, my hope is that the relationship that I have with my kids isn't damaged because dad was always the pain in the neck guy who was forcing me to go play basketball. So to me, that's, th- those are, those are two really important things. Cause in the long run, when my kids are 30 years old, uh, I want to have a positive relationship with them. I really don't care that they were a, you know, a high school varsity starter that that won't be important when they're 30. Uh, I, I really think that, you know, I was telling my 13 year old who's dying to play basketball for, you know, 12 months a year now. And that's what he thinks. Uh, and, and we're, he's in baseball and he plays football. I, you know, and I, I said, listen, I said, I'm just going to be honest with you. I said, if you're a competitor, uh, you'll compete in anything, in any sport. Right. So I, I think playing multiple sports is a great thing when you're young and you need to play multiple sports. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, you got a lot of baseball. We're in the South. You're, you're way up in Ohio. It's probably 15 inches of snow up there right now. <laughs> All right. So we play a lot of baseball and these kids are playing baseball 12 months a year. And it's an unnatural thing to be throwing a baseball and, and they have arm problems. And, you know, it's like 14 year old kids are having Tommy John surgery, you know, play baseball during baseball, play basketball during basketball, play football during football, uh, lacrosse run track do have fun and do different things um and then you can specialize later on but people think you know i mean there's eight-year-old specializing you you got you got rankings for eight-year-old kids and that just puts pressure on parents and 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 then you you know you said well you know my my kid probably doesn't like playing is all the time and that parent says "Well, well my kid does my kid wants to be in the gym all the time. My kid, well, really? So I, I would say that that parent is probably pushing that kid to be that kid, and he thinks the kid loves the game all the time. Yeah, exactly. And, but exactly. I mean, my kid's different. My kid wants to be in the gym all the time. And so what am I – well, that's probably bull. Your kid would like to be in the gym some and be playing Fortnite others and be on a headset hanging out with, with – his three best buddies playing Fortnite, which, you know, I'm not a big proponent of video games, but um, there's a time and a place for, for everything. And I think we got to back off a bit. Yeah. I think your point there, just whether it's video games or other sports or whatever, I think you have to do things just kind of like your diet. You have to do things in moderation. And if you do things in moderation, then I think you end up with better results. And, you know, when it comes to specializing, one of the things that, that I see that, that bothers me is when you have, adults and I, and here when I refer to adults I'm not referring to parents but I'm referring to coaches or program directors where those coaches are putting pressure on kids and families to only participate in their sport and so you know somebody comes and says well if you're going to be in our club or you're going to play our varsity sport at the school if you play another sport we don't want you and we need you to play year round and you can understand it to a certain degree from a coach's perspective that, you know, if you're a business owner, that's more money in your pocket. If you're a high school varsity coach and a kid's playing year round, you know, in your mind, it may be beneficial, but it still comes back to me that if you're a parent of a kid and a coach or an organization is telling you that you can't play other sports and you have to be with us year round, to me, that's a red flag. And I would immediately walk away and try to find a club, that's more child centered going back to that discussion that we had earlier. I think it's a shame to me that adults are dictating to kids what they can, what they can and can't do in terms of playing other sports. And again, I was a kid, but the last sport that I gave up, John was tennis. And I started, I stopped playing tennis. I I believe it was in sixth grade. And I I can remember the day that I wanted to stop playing. And we, we did a drill at this tennis lesson that I was at where somebody had made like a PVC pipe frame doorway and you had to stand in this PVC pipe doorway and step forward to hit your volley so that the bracket wouldn't hit the, you know, hit the doorway as you were standing there. And I remember coming home and telling my dad, dad, I'm done. I don't want to hit tennis balls out of doorways. Um, (laughs) I just want to, you know, I just, I'm like, I just want to play basketball, but that was, but that was kid driven. 
You know what I mean? Like I went home and said, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this. And I was a kid who, so even up through sixth grade, a kid who, like me who loved basketball, I was still playing. I played little league baseball. I played tennis. I played so much stuff out in, you know, just out in the yard with friends, um, you know, and now you don't see that. And so I think a lot of times, unfortunately, like I said, it's dictated by coaches and youth sports organizations that are putting pressure on families. And so I would tell any family out there that if a coach or an organization comes to you and says, we want your kid to play year round. And if you don't, then you can't be a part of what we're doing. Then I would just say, thank you for telling me that. And I would walk and find somebody else that is going to be more focused on the needs of your kid, as opposed to their needs as a coach or a, you know, a youth sports administrator. Um, all right. All right. Um, kind of winding things down. Cause I know you got to get to class. All right. Let me ask you this. Uh, I've got an eight year old, a 10 year old, a 12 year old, 14 year old is off season. Um, he's working out, you know, tell parents, you know, how many times a week or, or how many times a week or a month, uh, should my 12 year old Timmy be working out and be working on his game? What do I need to do? I don't want to get behind Mike. I can't get behind. This is my, my child's got a chance to play in the league. (laughs) <laughs> I don't want to get behind. So so I want to be fair to my son. I want to be fair to our family. I, I don't want to get behind. How many times a week should I be should I be sending him to a trainer? All right. Well if you're gonna go with a if you're gonna do a if you're gonna go to a trainer and the kid wants to go to the trainer, then I think what you could do is if you go once a week to the trainer and then your kid is gonna put in time on their own, not with you there not with the trainer there, not with somebody breathing down their neck, but they're actually going to put in time and work on some of the skills and drills and things that the trainer has worked with them on in between the training sessions, then I think once a week works great. If your kid doesn't pick up a basketball, except for that one time a week when they're going to the trainer, then I wouldn't even go to the trainer at all, to be honest with you, (laughs) because you're not going to see any improvement if the only time your kid touches a basketball is for one hour a week with the trainer, it's useless because really if you're a good trainer, what you're doing is not only are you working hard for that hour with the kid, but you're also giving the kid things that they can work on in between sessions with the trainer. And if the kid's not going to do that, then you're going to receive very little benefit. I mean, you might as well light your money on fire as opposed to giving it to that trainer. Cause you're just not an hour a week. You and I both know that an hour a week of working on your game, is not going to make you better. It's going to take much more than that. And you're better off just letting the kid go out and shoot on the driveway and, you know, play. And again, to have fun, you know, if a kid, if a kid is being sent to a trainer and that's the only time during the week that they're touching a basketball, then that kid doesn't love the game and probably isn't having much fun during that hour with the trainer anyway, because they'd probably rather be doing something else. Mike, third grade, Johnson city, Tennessee, my dad, a uh, very classy guy, um, Northeast guy, made me uh, choose a, a musical instrument. And he was like, you, you're going you're gonna to learn to play something. And I was Uh-oh, like, well, John, this, this I, story is going to scare I, me because I, 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 I got I, my own musical instrument story. I, so I was like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to play anything, Dad. I want to play ball. No, we're going to culture you. All right, all right, great. Uh, I, I choose the violin. All right, great. Uh, we're going to go learn to play the violin. I went once a week to this church to learn how to play the violin for one hour. And I was supposed to practice the, the, the rest of the week to get ready for the, the next lesson. Uh, I went for an hour. Um, I don't even know where my violin was the rest of the week. I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want to touch it. I'd go back to the, to the, to the violin trainer. Um, <laughs> and, and I was worse the next week and worse. And I was so bad after that year. I had, everybody had a year that my dad took the violin, sold it. And he was like, go outside and go play. And so that, go. that's exactly what you're saying. You know, as a parent, we do need to introduce things to our kids. But then For after sure. a while, I mean, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I had no interest in playing a violin other than I had no interest in playing a violin period. Um, and I, I could do Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, the, the first part of it, really good. I learned it. It took me one year to learn five notes, um, and I wasn't very good at it. But you're, you're saying the same thing with basketball. Uh, the, the training lesson should 
provoked a kid to go want to go work on his game. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm still a believer. I'm telling you, I'm a believer of I, – I thought I became a decent player because I was in my backyard playing one-on-one. And, it, and if, you, if me and you play one-on-one and I get tired of getting beat by you, Mike, I'm going to figure out a way to get by or For I'm going to sure. figure out a way to, to, to get a stop or I'm going to figure out a way to – if you're backing off of me, i got to get my stroke better because i got to make some shots. If I'm competitive enough, if you'll play one-on-one enough – uh, you'll become a better player, and then all of a sudden you got two guys joining you, and then you got four guys joining you. you play three on three. There's, I you know we talked about this. I don't think there's a better game in the world than three on three basketball with a dribble or without a dribble. It teaches you how to play, and everybody touches the daggum ball. Yeah, I've been having some uh, some Twitter conversation with people about you know just ways that we can improve youth basketball. And to me, I've said I can make a very very compelling case that. If all we did was play three on three basketball up through, let's say up through sixth grade, that we'd end up with more skilled players and we'd end up with players who liked playing a lot more than playing five on five and running up and down the floor. Like I, I have a third grade daughter and we played, uh, we played basketball with her this year and I coached the team and, you know, we played, <clears throat> you know, we're playing, sometimes we play in a full regulation size high school court with, third grade girls and because there is no other option for where to play and so you know I know I can control the environment as the coach so I know my girls are having fun and learning and whatever but I could make the case that we spent during a game the game is the least valuable part of being a member of our team <laughs> what's valuable is the practice time because during the game we're spending so much time running between the two tops of the key as opposed to actually playing and having the ball in our hands versus when you're playing three on three there's no way to hide. Everybody's everybody's involved in the action, both offensively and defensively. There's so many more touches and opportunities. The floor is space. You don't have eight or ten players just standing in the key where nobody can drive and, and make a move or have to make decisions. And well, let, let me let proponent. me ask you this. All right. Okay. So so football, in in youth football, uh, Tommy, you're playing tackle. Uh, Clint, you're playing guard. Uh, Teddy, you're playing center, and and you put guys in spots, right? You're playing running back, and everybody, and then we got about fifteen to twenty five seconds to get everybody settled. Correct? Correct. Baseball, uh, Mike, you're at third. Andrew, you're at short. Tommy, you're at second. JC, you're at first. We put everybody on a base, right? Everybody's Correct. got everybody's got a position. Soccer, you're the forward. You're this. You're the goalie. You're that. Everybody's got a spot. All right. The, the the hardest game to me to teach is basketball because of spacing and everybody's got to play O and everybody's got to play D and you got to go from O to D and you got all this stuff. I think it's a really difficult game to teach and a difficult game to learn. And if you're going to teach these young kids at age eight or seven or six, they have no idea about spacing. Playing five on five is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. It, it's ridiculous. Why don't so so if you got five on five, you got ten people playing. Why don't you just go to the gym uh, for your allotted time at the Y and put six kids on one end and six kids on the other end and play three on three? I don't care. Have a league of of you know that same team that's got got ten people on the team. Let them, instead of playing five-on-five, five, let them play the other team and play in two games of three-on-three. Three. And now you got yeah, more now you got more kids doing it, and you got – and everybody's teaching the same thing. You're teaching passing and cutting or passing the screen. If I mean, have you ever seen a screen, an action, a screen, not a ball screen, a screen in a eight-year-old five-on-five five game? Never. Any, Never. ever, in the history of the game. But if you played three on three and really taught them two things, you know, passing and cutting or passing and go screen away, then actually you may get something out of it and you may teach them about spacing and that you don't want to be standing. You know, I, I get so sick and tired of look watching kids coming to the ball instead of going away from the ball and, and spacing the court. Uh, I just think three on three. I th I think three on three is the best game. And I, you know, it, it may take. Why don't I got a great idea, Mike? All right, lay it on me. Why don't you and Head Start Basketball start a three on three youth league? 
I'll promote it. I'll get Billis to promote it. We'll get everybody to promote it uh, and, and do things right with those young kids. Just because everybody else is playing five on five, everybody, listen, when a parent goes to a game uh, and you're a parent, you're watching who? You're, wa- you're watching your own kid. You want your own kid to have the ball. You want you, you're watching your own kid. All right, and so when a parent goes to a game and they're playing five-on-five and their kid never touches it, they come back and they say, well, Tommy never throws me the ball. Tommy doesn't throw my son the ball. Well, if you play three-on-three, your son's going to touch the ball, period. End of story. And so I think parents would like it more. I think the kids would like it more, but nobody's doing it because of nobody's doing it. So right, somebody's well, we're gonna put, we're, somebody's got to start gonna it. it. We're going to put it together. We're going to put it together. We're going to brainstorm, figure out how to make it how to make it a reality. Because I think if we could do that, we would have. I'm going to circle back to the beginning of the conversation. Kids would have more fun, right? Yep. Three no on doubt. three would definitely make it more fun. They would learn more of the fundamentals of the game, and then they'd want to come back and play more. And to me, again, for when we're talking youth basketball. Those are the three most important components of whatever it is that you're doing. That could be playing in a league. That could be going to a trainer. That could be going to a skill development session with a group, whatever. Those three things should always be present when you're talking about youth basketball. You're not going to get better if you don't want to come back to the gym. Exactly. So if yep. you're not if you're yep. not learning what to do when you go back to the gym and you don't have fun, then you're not going to want to come back to the gym. Listen, I didn't want to go back to violin practice. I hated it yep. with a passion. And so yep. I'm just going to tell you, I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to be good at it. It wasn't even yeah, fun. My kids, my kids are the same way. We, we, to your point about introducing things to kids, we introduced both our kids. My son played the trombone. My daughter played the violin. They each played for, I think my daughter played for two years. My son played for like a year and a half. And, it, you know, again, they never, ever, ever, never picked up that instrument in between <laughs> sessions i mean they just they just didn't unless we forced them to and so after a certain point you're like okay well we introduced this th- to them but they obviously don't enjoy it enough to want to pick it up so why are we continuing to rent the instrument for 30 bucks a month and pull our hair out trying to get them to practice when it's not something that they enjoy now if we had never provided them with the opportunity to try it then i think we're doing our kids a disservice but once you've exposed them to whether it's a sport an instrument whatever and they've demonstrated over time that they're not interested in it, then you got to find something else that's going to be their passion. And for a lot of kids, basketball is not going to be their passion. So why not let them have fun? Why not let them learn? Why not let them be with friends? Why not let them get get some exercise? And in the course of doing that, the kids that do love it are going to eventually rise to the top anyway, regardless of what we do as parents, because ultimately success in the game is going to be driven by the individual player and not by somebody's mom or dad. Well, listen, I've got a challenge to you. And one, uh, once I, once again, I really appreciate your time this morning, but I got a challenge to you is do something different. You got an opportunity up there in that Cleveland, Ohio area uh, to do a three on three league, to do something in the fall, do something in the spring, make it fun, play your three on three, let the Y league do what they want to do. Let everybody else be lazy and do what they've been doing for 128 years, because this is what we do. All right. Forget about doing what we do. Do something different. You see, uh, you got a vision. Um, I, I, you know, we, we kind of got the same vision to you, to you truth. Go do it, go do it, be different and, uh, go impact kids and we'll help you along the way. How about that? That's what it's all about. 100% in agreement, John. Well, I, I appreciate your time. Now, and the last thing I'll tell you, pulling your hair out. I saw a picture of you, Mike. I, I'm not sure yeah. you can do that. <laughs> I can't. Do, I cannot do that. And honestly, <laughs> I wish I could because I tell people all the time, like I'll have my students at school say, Mr. Cleansing, you're bald. I'm like, well, I'm not quite bald, but I wish I was because then I wouldn't have to deal with, uh, you know, shaving the head. So, <laughs> so you're right. I'm not, I'm not pulling out much hair, but uh, – I understand. Um, yeah. I understand. Hopefully, <laughs> I, I I do want to see you at Billis this summer. Got it? Yeah, we're there. We're there. We're gonna be we're gonna be there for sure. And we're working on with uh, working on with John Searby. Hopefully, something that also is gonna be gonna be great that we're gonna bring to Cleveland too. So all right, great. We'll see, I can't can't say anything more about that yet until we get it all confirmed. But hopefully, that's gonna happen too. So I'm excited about the opportunities to uh, you know to get a chance to work with 
with, with Jay and all of you guys have been a part of that for a few years and uh, we're excited to come down and be a part of it. Well, we're going to have a good time, man. I, I appreciate your time. Go, go, to, go to class and, and go uh, impact young people. Got it. I'm going to, I'm going to try. All I'm right, buddy. Try. Take care. Thanks, thanks again. All right, John. Yeah. All thanks. Right, all right. Thanks. <laughs>